Hi, everybody. I wanted to, to, to introduce Jacob Runge, who, uh, who works at the JLR uh, German Data Space Center, who's been doing a lot of cool work on inferring uh, cause, you know, causal drivers of various cool phenomena. So yeah, Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the opportunity here. And uh, I hope actually yeah, that uh, this is of, of use to, to many of you. It's, uh, um, my group kind of works on inferring causation from climate uh, data a lot, but uh, what these challenges are that are underlying climate data, I think that uh, they are very relevant also in many other fields. So that's why I think it's, uh, it's of help. And um, the general topic will be causation, inferring causation from time series, giving an overview of the state of the art challenges and application cases. So my group, just to briefly introduce, we are uh, located in Jena, in the center of Germany, and we basically develop methods and cooperate a lot with climate scientists, uh, but also from other fields in order to develop those methods. Um, yeah, to kind of start with the animation coming uh, from NASA, which is the kind of German, uh, or the, the equivalent in the US from German Aerospace Center. Um, that is maybe to, to just pose the problem that, well, it's a complex system that we deal with in, in my uh, field. Um, and that the challenges that we have here inferring causation from different sub-processes of the system uh, is, is quite challenging, but that many of those are quite related to, uh, to many other fields. So to step um, one step back and look at the problem of inferring causality from, yeah, maybe a more uh, historical view even. If you uh, distinguish, there's like three strands of uh, inferring causality. One is maybe the gold standard is doing real experiments. This is the way we, we gained knowledge about uh, the physical equations that we know about, not just how the earth moves, but how many physical systems uh, operate. And uh, that is something pioneered uh, by, uh, by Galileo Galilei, if I may post this quite historically here. And uh, the other guy here is uh, Svante Arrhenius, who is a famous climate scientist. And uh, the picture is more to show you how limited it is to do real experiments in, in the climate system, because uh, for reasons of complexity, for reasons of ethical uh, standards, we shouldn't mingle with the climate system uh, more than we already do in a rather uncontrolled way, which led to anthropogenic climate change. So this little uh, weather toolkit for, for kids here is quite a dangerous thing, I would say. Um, the thing we have in climate, though, which is maybe singular compared to many other fields, is that we know a lot about the workings of climate and we have uh, simulation tools to study the climate, to predict climate and to model what happens under given experimental conditions. But those are all within the realism of those climate models. And so in other fields, it's the same. We, we, we are restricted to the realism of those models. Which brings me to the last uh, option is that we have the data, um, which comes here in this table from kind of station-based uh, data that has been collected already in the beginning of the 19th century. And today uh, we have a big fleet of satellites that observe uh, the Earth. And in other fields, obviously, we have sensors that give us huge amounts of data, which uh, we hope to utilize to learn something about how the underlying system works. So to give you an overview, I will talk now about the causal discovery problem in general, and then how, how it can be addressed in general, and then the state of the art and some challenges and application examples. So one of the earliest opponents, actually, of, uh, of anything related to causality was what's Carl Pearson, whom you may know from the Pearson correlation coefficient. And uh, if I may translate his uh, elaborate uh, British um, quote here, it basically says that correlation is, is not causation. And he was very eminent uh, as a scientist in, in London to kind of uh, oppress any thinking, any mathematical formulation of uh, causation in, uh, in the coming decades. So that is at least the account of history I kind of take from uh, Judah Pearl, who you see on the lower left. I actually wonder whether you see my uh, pointer. You do? Okay. So um, Judah Pearl here on the left, and then these other three guys are uh, Peter Spiritus, Clark Lemer, and Richard Shines, and they basically pushed forward the topic of, of causal inference from observational data in the past decades. And the kind of first uh, mantra is, yeah, correlation is not causation, it's not general, 
But uh, the field of causal inference is really about identifying assumptions and methods that enable to learn causal relations from observational data. And it's really about identifying assumptions and the term enable is a more positive formulation, I would say, rather than saying, oh, we have to make those assumptions that limits us. But the whole field is very exciting because there's many things we actually know about a system and under several of these assumptions we can learn from causal relations. So this is what I try to convey to you. So to put the problem down here um, and kind of distinguish the causal discovery problem from another problem that Pearl often addresses, uh, we often are given a data set here, a large scale time series data set, maybe coming from Earth or other fields, and there's many complexities underlying these. And you could argue that underlying the, the, the data or the data generating process, we could argue that there is some causal model that generated the data. And this may, of course, be very complex, maybe the physical equations that generate whatever we measure of the climate system. And so this notation here is each of those variables will, by some functional dependence, uh, depend on the other variables. And these both axes here basically in this case, the past of all other processes and will depend on some noise term, which may resolve um, complexities that are not grasped within those variables. And if you unfold that, then each of those variables will depend by some individual functional dependency on the others. And uh, this notation now says that it may not also only depend on lacks of the other variables, but also on contemporaneous dependencies. So this kind of Instantaneous causation is, of course, something that is more um, in a model of the case rather than talking of this in the real world because the speed of light is finite, so you could argue there's no such thing, but it depends on how uh, your time resolution is. So this is more uh, a modeling choice here. So the basic premise is now, well, we, we could assume that um, each of those variables, x1, x2, x3, and so on, they don't depend on all other variables, but they depend on some subset, which we call the parents um, of the other variables. And this gives us some hope to, to model these uh, systems in a, in a more parsimonious way and to understand them in a parsimonious way. So now, given this kind of causal model, we can translate that into a graph where uh, you would represent the parents of each of the variables by an arrow pointing inwards and this is now the graphical representation of uh, such a causal model. So actually, in this case, we can also man, represent time lags as some label of those links. And for this particular graphical model, as an example, you would have this kind of underlying uh, equations, which of course you don't know. And this is just the, the assumption that will later on relate uh, how we can speak about causality from uh, the observational data. So now the question of causal discovery as opposed to what Pearl often addresses in what he calls causal inference is that in, in the Pearl paradigm, causal discovery like learning the causal graph from the data is challenging. And so you can also already start with the causal graph by your expert knowledge. And then once you have that graph, which is of course an assumption already, then the theory of Pearl um, is about, given such a graph, can we identify the effect of interventions? For example, an intervention might be, we intervene in X3, maybe set it to some value, X star here. What is the effect of this intervention on the other variables? And this is then in his framework uh, captured in what is called the do calculus. So what's the probability? distribution of X4, given that X3 was set to some value. And this is, this is uh, a problem that is, that is um, beautifully addressed in, in his works because he gives you um, the tools to learn under which assumptions this uh, quantity, which is a due quantity, like uh, an interventional distribution, under which assumptions you can learn this from the observed data alone. And that you can read in his book, it might be another lecture, but what I want to talk today about is, well, what if, as in many situations, we do not know the whole graph and we want to learn it as well as possible from the data. So 
This is trying to address the problem of learning which links are only indirect, which links are uh, spurious, trying to uncover a parsimonious uh, causal graphical model from the data with, without specifying the physical equations or the, the causal model underlying, which can be a second step. So the task is really to learn this graph uh, from the and how that in principle can work, uh, I want to show you in kind of a nutshell uh, example. So this is basically already an intuition of how these algorithms work. So suppose you have now two uh, variables and um, I don't even talk about time order now because the theory is quite general and time order helps, but uh, it doesn't require it in every case. So suppose you have two variables X and Y and you measure, all you can do is you have measurements of those and you can measure dependencies. So you might measure that the scatter plot between those two looks like this. So without much further testing, you could say that they are dependent. And the question of causal discovery is now, what can we say about the underlying causal graphical model, about basically which variables depend on which in the underlying equations based on statistical um, dependencies that we can measure. So here in this case, um, the data generating process might be that X causes Y in some way that leads to this kind of scatter plot here, but uh, very equivalently Y can cause X and it would give a similar scatter plot, a similar dependence. And then why not having a common driver, which is here illustrated by this bi-directed edge influencing both such that they become uh, correlated in, the, in such a way. So I've shown you now three ways basically and uh, the causal Markov condition says that there's only those uh, three ways, which I mean, they were quite generic. So, um, and the causal Markov condition is already a first important assumption underlying causal discovery. And it says that if we measure a dependence, then there must be some connectedness. And this connectedness is, of course, formalized. It means there is some uh, relation, some, some path in the underlying graph. So the Markov condition on the left-hand side has a statistical property, and on the right-hand side has a property about the underlying causal relations and the graph in particular of those. So dependence means something must have led to this dependence. So this is not, not a too strong assumption, you could argue. Um, now move on to maybe having more variables to make this more interesting. What if we have measured now a variable Z and I'm now looking in this three dimensional scatter plot here. And if we measure dependence in, in the bivariate case, we can now measure conditional dependence. So suppose we have observed a conditional independence, which is denoted by this X orthogonal of Y given Z and which you can quantify or define by the joint density of X and Y given Z factorizing into the marginal densities of P of X given Z times P of Y given Z. So I like to look at this all in, in the scatter plot, which means that holding Z fixed, which is this conditioning here, uh, we observe an independence among those red points that are within those uh, environment here, let's say. And what this says is that there is no statistical relationship between X and Y that is not due to Z. So there's nothing between X and Y that cannot be explained by Z. Both are statistically independent. So now the question is going again back to the underlying causal relations. What are we willing to say about the causal relations uh, based on such a statistical observation? And if you now say that, well, there cannot be such a uh, connectedness between X and Y that is not due to Z. So we can remove the link. And this is already an assumption for which you can find some kind of pathological counterexamples, but it is an assumption. It's called the faithfulness assumption, which says that basically the other direction than the Markov assumption. It says that if we measure a conditional independence, then there's no causal link in the model. And this is again a statistical relationship on the left hand side and a causal model relationship on the right hand side of this implication. <coughs> so this is uh, the second important assumption that um, is used in, in causal discovery. And 
what we learn from this is that we have a causal graph now between x, y, and z that looks like this, but what are the options now among them? So we can either have that z is causing x and y, we can have that x causes z, z causes y, we can have the other direction. We cannot distinguish this from just having measured this one conditional independence. We just know x and y are independent given z, so we cannot say which of these holds uh, true. And this forms what is called a Markov equivalence class, so, which means that these three cases are visualized uh, in this way here by these kind of edges, and they cannot be distinguished based on this one conditional independence that we measure here. So, turning, making this example more, more interesting, what if we measure more variables, uh, V and, and W here, and suppose that we measure um, this kind of long list of uh, conditional independencies, but they are summarized quite easy. First of all, V and W are independent, say we have this scatter plot here, and all other pairs are basically independent uh, given Z. So the condition is always on Z here. So that um, based on the faithfulness assumption, we could draw this graph. So we have this kind of star motif. We removed all the links that belong to these uh, X between X and W and Y and V and so on. Based on this faithfulness assumption, we removed those links. And the others are dependent, so that's important to notice here. Now, going back to really the causal model um, that we can have among these, which causal models explain these? So which ways of drawing a graph, basically? And another assumption that we do uh, on this slide is that there's no unobserved variables, which is, of course, unrealistic, but we will um, weaken that uh, in the next slide. So now, there's, for the lower part here, uh, the question of which causal models are consistent uh, with these observed, observed relationships. So that's usually a question I ask in the, in the audience. Is this uh, a realistic causal model? So if you think of whether this causal model is consistent with the observation that V and W are actually independent, and uh, you will notice that it's it's not consistent because if Z would drive V and Z would cause also W, then V and W, they should be um, dependent by the, the Markov condition. So the fact that they are not implies that this orientation of those links is not um, a possible one. And the next option is this kind of chain here but also here, if V drives Z and Z drives W, then also V and W would be dependent by transitivity, you could say. And also then they would be dependent, and that's why this is also not consistent with the observation. And this is the symmetric other direction. So we now went through all possible ways of drawing an edge between these three variables, and we remained at this one, which says that V drives Z and W drives Z. Because with this causal graph, uh, you have um, the relationship that V and W are actually independent, which is what we observed here. So this is the only consistent uh, causal graph for the lower part that we can, that is uh, in accordance with our observation, observed uh, dependencies. Now, <coughs> let's go on to the upper part, because knowledge of the lower part cannot help in saying which causal directions are possible for the upper part. So if we go now and start again going through the possible ways of orienting those things, then we might have this graph now. And looking again at our observed condition independencies, we can quickly see that this is not consistent because if this was the graph, then for example, Y and W should be independent. There, there's no connection between the two. Um, and on the other hand, we observe that they are dependent, uh, which is here. And similar X and V would be independent, but we have observed that they are actually dependent and they only become independent given Z. So this is not consistent with this graph. Also, this is not consistent. And the only thing that remains is actually this graph, um, which says that, well, Z drives X and Z drives uh, Y, while we have this, uh, incoming collider, as it's called in the graph language, for the lower part. 
So all I've done here is I use those two assumptions, which are um, the first one not very contentious uh, in, uh, in the community. And the second one, you can find some cases where this is violated, but in general, it's not. And so we learned this just from making those uh, assumptions and from studying conditional independencies in the data. But for this graph, to arrive at this graph, we made the assumption that there's no unobserved variables. So this kind of weakens the whole thing, you, you could argue. But there's more to learn. So this is the only possible model here. What if now we assume that there could be so-called latent variables, which are unobserved, but still we have to stay consistent with the observed condition independencies. So can it be that there's a latent variable that causes X and that causes Z? And therefore the link between X and Z that we see is just due to this common driver. So if you now study again the, the condition independencies, then you see that well, this cannot be because X and V, they would not be dependent uh, for this kind of causal model because L drives X, L drives Z, but there's no way L drives V. So there's no connectedness between X and V in, in this graph. And therefore, this is not a possible graph. On the other hand, having kind of L as an intermediate uh, variable you cannot rule out this, this case. That can drive L, L can drive X, and you would still be consistent with all those observed conditional uh, independencies. And the other direction we ruled out already before. So that means when we now interpret this edge um, without the assumption of no unobserved variables, then we just say Z drives X, but potentially indirectly. But it still has a causal effect. Z on X has a causal effect. And the same holds for Z on Y. Uh, and also, yeah, please. If, it, if uh, an observed variable was causing X, Z, V, many different variables, there was no yeah. locality of action, could that violate this? Um, if L was causing all of them, then we would not measure any conditional independence, but we measured it, and therefore there cannot be a common driver of all of them. Well, okay, it's the one that I'm thinking of, X, uh, uh, the L was causing V. It seems like I would still hold, but I may be missing something. If L only causes V, no, then it's uh, not. Uh, yeah, then X it, and V. Would that work or not? If it causes X and V, then this would violate um, the finding that X and V are independent given Z. Oh, yeah. Because, so it's sort of I mean, of course, I'm, I'm talking kind of about perfect statistical tests here. And oh, okay. that's, of course, uh, the thing. Okay. This is so going back to, to, to the lower part here, we, we ruled out this direction because Z cannot cause V even indirectly. But what about this? If L causes a V and L causes Z and then Z causes X, then X and V are dependent and they become independent given Z because this blocks the path. So this is consistent with our observation. So we cannot rule out this case. Or L could also be an intermediate node on this, on this link here. So the way we uh, conclude now is <coughs> um, we draw this kind of graph, which we interpret as Z is a direct or indirect cause of X and Y. And the lower part here is interpreted as Z is not a cause of V or W. So that's all you can say about the lower part. But it can still be that there's a common driver between Z and V or that there's a direct or indirect link. So we arrived at this conclusion now with a kind of uh, good conclusion for the upper part. We can, this, even though we do not assume that there's, uh, that there's no latent variables, we take them into account, we can still conclude on a causal statement for the upper part, while for the lower part here, uh, we, we cannot. And the trick we used basically is this collider structure. This is a very important notion in, in the causal discovery to if you find two arrows pointing towards one variable, then this has uh, very nice implications on the underlying dependencies that you can make use of using these two uh, causal Markov and faithfulness assumption. Um, so we've just made those two assumptions and these are the basis, uh, the cornerstones of, of causal inference methods. But um, if you have time order, like in climate often and in many other fields, then you can additionally use these. 
because for example causal effects can only go forward in time if you don't well go into wormholes or some uh, stuff like this and therefore you can often um, orient a lot more links in the time series case okay so this is an important example that I wanted to show you and that I spent quite some time on because it gives you the basic intuition of, of causal discovery in a, in a nutshell. And now I go, if you don't have any questions, to kind of an overview of the state of the art. So I kind of will fill this slide with now four conceptual approaches. Yeah, some question? Yes, question. So does the time series data always have to be stationary? Is that why you can deduce that there's always a, a certain time, temporal order or most of um, my network data is not stationary. That's a big problem. You can, so stationarity is kind of a separate problem. You can, you can argue that your, your graph, your causal model changes over time. It's a difficulty and it turns into an ill post statistical problem if you don't make assumptions like Maybe it's just smoothly varying. Maybe there's periods where it always, the same causal model recurs. So it's, it's a challenge, but it's a separate problem that you can also address using certain assumptions on, on the, the way the stationarity, the non-stationarity is. Like usually you wouldn't assume that it's completely non-stationary. At each, at each instance of time, there's a completely new causal model that's not very realistic and the more you can assume that there's some regularity uh, in this, the more you can you can do. Understood. So for my use case, actually, I have network data. So the actual causal model does change over time. One network router might impact another one. So within a certain time window, can I still use this uh, CMI, KNN, and um, um, PTMSI? There's no stationary at all, but within that certain data, uh, let's say about five, uh, 500 points, but that's still yeah, it, it, valid? It, it depends. So. So I mean, I will I will come to the kind of the, the specifics uh, later, but it's there. There's several ways you can do it. You can either try to to model the underlying mechanism that generates the non-stationarity. Uh, you can use shorter windows where you assume that your models are stationary, and yeah, these are the kind of options. Okay. I will, yeah. Um, um, one more question: When you're looking, um, if you have unknown um, time delays in that graph. Do you just search with all possible? Um, yeah, I will show that. that, that okay. exact, I, will, I will show that right now because this is what my, my main goal also is time independent systems. So, so that's why I, I kind of start here with Granger causality because this is uh, already from the from the 60s a first kind of formulation of, of causality, even though it's always called Granger causality and harshly distinguished from causality in, in many works in the past decades. And the basic idea is um, you have a model to test whether X uh, influences Granger causally influences Y, where you say Y at time T, uh, you model it as a function of the past of, of Y by, for example, a linear model, and you model it as a function of the past of X up to some maximum time delay P here. And then there's a residual error term here. And you use that model, and then you fit another model, which is the nested model, which is just the same model omitting x. So obviously, you will get other beta coefficients here and other noise. And then you compare those two models. So if the modeling error, like the residual variance or some other statistic, is, is smaller if the first model is better predicting uh, than the second model. In general, if there's any difference in, in the two models regarding their uh, uh, prediction uh, performance, then that is called to, then you conclude that X Granger causes Y at any of those lags here. And the basic intuition you can also formulate more generally is that, and now I represent what, what you were asking for, I represent, represent uh, the kind of causal graph resolved in time. So X is now represented at different instances of time up to some maximum time delay. And range of causality ba basically tests whether there's some information in the past of X, some predictive power about Y at time T that is not already contained in the past of Y in basically the autocorrelations here. 
And that's the more general formulation of, of Granger causality and um, uh, famous methods that are based on this principle are like transfer entropy in, in an information theoretic framework. And well, there's several uh, generalizations using not just linear models, of course, but uh, other ways to model. Or you can use a neural net to model uh, y at t as a function of its own past and as a function of x. And then you have to compare the residual errors. And there's quite some caveats because model complexity also influences this. So what you can also do is you can include other variables that here because I was talking about that being a common driver previously and also in the time series case this can be. So to exclude the effect of that, um, you can just put it in your model and then still compare in this extended model what the effect of the past of X on, on Y at MT is that is not already explained by, by Z. Um, what you cannot do is some, some caveats here. So first of all, if your dependencies are nonlinear, you use the linear model, you will not find the causality or you will not find that there is no causality here. So you make false positives and false negative errors. Um, secondly, if, if your time resolution is not high enough, and for example, X causes itself at time T is, is the case typically, and then X at time T has an error down here to Y at time T. So contemporaneous dependencies, they are not captured and they lead to wrong conclusions because then even though there's maybe no relationship, you can uh, find that there's a relationship between uh, two variables. So it doesn't exclude uh, common drivers or uh, in the intermediate links uh, within contemporaneous relations. And another thing is that if there's quite a lot of n, uh, quite another, a large number of variables and large time delays, then uh, you will have to build a very big model. And the question is, can you uh, fit this well from uh, finite samples? So to overcome basically these two uh, problems, the problem of, of contemporaneous relations and also of having too high dimension, too high model complexity, um, you can use the same idea I showed you before. So to iterate now quickly through like to an example, suppose you have this true process where I now um, draw arrows here um, between the variables at different instances of time. So here X uh, is caused by Y at the same time. Y causes Z with a time delay. Z and W have autocorrelation and Z drives W at the same time. And you use the same idea I showed you in the example and to just list a few ways to test conditional independence, you can use partial correlation, which is restricted to uh, linear cases. Gaussian processes can be used to uh, model additive nonlinear dependencies and conditional mutual information is um, something that I developed where it's based on uh, a test based on the well-known conditional mutual information, which doesn't make the additivity assumption. And well, they come at a price, of course, like if you are able to model very general dependencies, then you will have low detection power for simpler relationships. That's the no free lunch theorem. So, so these network learning algorithms, they proceed in the same way I, uh, I've kind of iterated through in the, in the beginning. So you first test um, unconditional dependencies. So this is called skeleton discovery phase. And this P here stands for the cardinality of your conditions. So First, you condition on nothing. You just test which variables are dependent. And those that are dependent, you draw an edge, an arrow here. And you do that for all pairs. And you assume stationarity. So testing Z and W at time T implies that there is a link between uh, Z T minus 1 and W T minus 1. So this is the stationarity thing. And in the next iteration, you would now just condition on one dimensional conditions and you would choose them smartly and there's certain heuristics to do so. And whenever, for example, in this case here, um, X at T minus one and Z at time T are independent given Y at T minus one, because that's the common driver of both. So conditioning on these will remove this link and in a similar way for many other links in this example, so they all get removed just by having a one dimensional condition, which is a pretty efficient, uh, not so high dimensional um, test as for Granger causality. And last you go to uh, 
P equal two and condition on two dimensional sets and that will remove the remaining links. So what we uh, converge to now is uh, the true skeleton. So it tells us which adjacencies are there, but only for lagged links, it tells us the direction because time order helps us. But for the links between contemporaneous links here between Z and W, we do not know at this stage whether Z causes W or W causes Z. And the same for X and Y. Then comes the logic I've also told you through, like based on these, which uh, pairs are dependent and which are not, and which way of orienting the link is consistent with what we measured. And in this case, this would help to orient in the orientation phase, the link from Z to W, because you can use that Y is uh, driving Z and this Z uh, the path is driving its, uh, its, its itself. So this collider structure again helps you to orient this link. But uh, the, the Markov equivalence class here says that between X and Y, you do not know the causal direction. You cannot uh, learn that from the data. So this is a certain limitation of these methods because they only use the condition independence information and that limits it to a certain Markov equivalence class. And now comes uh, another quite recent conceptual approach that I haven't talked about before, which is framed as structural causal models and um, an intuition for one of those methods just here is as follows. So suppose we measure between X and Y such a relationship again, looking at the scatter plot. And we now make an assumption, for example, in what is called the Lingam uh, model, which is phrased as the linear non-Gaussian additive model. So the name already says that if you can assume that X and Y are linearly dependent and that either of the noise terms is non-Gaussian, then you can, what is called, identify the causal relation between those two by the following method. So you fit a model of um, X as a function of Y, and this would be the linear black fit line here. And then you look at the residual and uh, test its independence with, with Y, with a supposed cause variable here. And in this case, because here the ground truth is that uh, Y causes X, you would find an independence. While in the other direction, you would see something different, uh, not an independence. And you can already see that the fit line in the other direction looks pretty awkward. And this asymmetry here is something that is utilized in this uh, class of methods, because it only occurs um, then this, this asymmetry leads you to, to conclude that here Y causes X. And why non-Gaussian? Well, if you have a Gaussian noise, and I'm kind of visually proving this here, then the fits in both directions are equally well. And this is actually a, a mathematical theorem and probability theory that if and only if you have uh, a Gaussian, then you can always find a model in both directions that has this property of the residual being independent. So this is just to give you an intuition of, you can use those network learning algorithms up to a certain degree of discovering the causal structure and for the rest so this is a typical way you can use these kind of methods to uh, find which causes which and obviously this is only relevant for contemporaneous uh, relationships because all others are already oriented by time order so that's the nice thing about time series okay a last class of methods that i don't really want to go into much now is um, coming more from nonlinear dynamics from the physics perspective and there the strong assumption is that you have an underlying uh, kind of smooth nonlinear dynamical system that is also deterministic. So this might be warranted, but usually you have a certain degree of complexity that um, makes it more suitable to go to the other types of methods which have a stochastic view of uh, the world, basically. But this approach here is called nonlinear state space methods. Is also based on a certain asymmetry in predicting points on the attractor that you first need to reconstruct. So I'm not really going into, into detail much now. There's uh, quite some work comparing it in, in my papers, uh, in a recent paper of 2019, to um, these other methods, which shows that for the highly deterministic case, there's some pros for this method, but usually it will not work as well as the others. But of course, it depends strongly on, on, on your system and your study.
Okay, I'm moving now to a method that I developed that is based on, on these network learning algorithms. And this is um, available in the TigerMite 4.1 now uh, Python package on, on GitHub. And it's been published uh, last year where you can find a lot of description of it. And it uses the same ideas um, as the causal network learning algorithms. And it addresses the problem of linear and nonlinear relations and time series relations. You can have also categorical variables if you don't have continuous um, data because it's based on conditional independence testing. And if you have a conditional independence test that captures relationships like a kernel independence test between categorical variables, then you can just plug that into this method. So it's again the causal discovery problem. And um, I also address the problem of strong autocorrelation here in this method. And um, it uses the same assumptions as before and is flexible regarding independence tests. So I'm not trying to go into, into detail here. It's just, it's based on two steps. The first step is basically the same as I've showed you before, the skeleton discovery stage, um, step. And the thing is, there's uh, some statistical issues with that if you have strong autocorrelation because they lead to inflated false positives. You get too many links. And this is fixed by a second step here that then addresses uh, the high autocorrelation issue. And yeah, you can read more about this in, in the paper. And the thing is, you can use this with any of those condition independence tests, whether you assume that the data is linear or nonlinear or completely not even additive. You can plug those different independence tests in. Mm. This is just an experimental setup, um, but I, I like to go through examples more from, from real life to discuss these more. You can look in the, in the paper to see that large numbers of comparison studies, uh, why it works better for the high dimensional case compared to, for example, lasso regression or just VAR modeling or also the PC algorithm, the original one. So there's quite some challenges that I'm addressing here, this autocorrelation issue and high dimensionality. So here the number of variables is like 100 and the sample size is 150. So it's quite a high dimensional problem and you can still recover a lot of the causal links and still control your false positives here. So that's the takeaway from this. And you can see that in the science advances paper. Um, some, some real world challenges for causal discovery and this is kind of a figure that you can also read in, in the Nature Communications paper. And many of those challenges, I think, are quite generic. And um, to iterate a little bit, autocorrelation, I, I mentioned that a bit, uh, why this is a problem regarding statistical testing. Time delays um, require to take into account basically a bigger uh, number of well time delays. And this increases the complexity, the, the number of uh, the size of the graph, basically. You have nonlinear dependencies, which you would need to address. Um, there can be chaotic state dependence. I mentioned that in the, in the, for this one method that addresses this. Um, there might be things like different time scales and climate. This is quite relevant here. Uh, the noise distributions might be extreme values, and this is a statistical problem. On the data side, um, what I draw here as this kind of regions, you first need to define your variables. So. In climate, it's often a problem of what quantity you actually want to capture and how to extract that from the data. But I think this is in many fields. You have measured a whole lot of things and you want to measure a certain quantity that is somewhat an emergent property of it. You would first need to dimensionally reduce your data. Um, I talked about unobserved variables and how they can still, uh, even despite those, you can still learn something. You might have an issue with time subs sampling. So this is illustrated here. If, if your sensor only uh, captures every second or every other um, um, sample, then, and your causal relations are faster than the sampling interval, then you might overlook certain relationships. So this is an issue. Um, time aggregation, if your data is accumulated, um, say you have monthly data, but the processes happen on a shorter time scale, then you might end up with causal cycles or you get things that are hard to represent uh, or you, it's hard to identify then the causal structure. Um, you might have measurement errors that obviously are not good like for any statistical method. 
uh, missing values uh, can occur and if they are related to the underlying process then this can form a selection bias problem. I mean selection bias is I think a big problem in any of the tests that you do a lot when not every one responds and clicks on the survey or whatever and the reason why they don't click on the survey is due to something that you actually want to measure so this is a problem and um, discrete data is just uh, something where you need to adapt your, your statistical tools to. Uh, in paleo data, you have dating uncertainties. I don't think that's a big problem in, in many, most other fields. And then on a computational to statistical side, uh, you have sample size, too big sample size, uh, making it too slow, the methods, uh, too slow, too small sample size, making it statistically challenging. And high dimensionality is, of course, a problem that the method I developed tries to address and uncertainty estimation. Okay. So this is um, basically the community works on a lot of these problems and uh, you will find in the perspective paper that uh, I, I mentioned, you will find a lot of references uh, to those issues. So just closing with some actually application examples that might give you an intuition of how these might be useful in, in your cases. Um, so one, one example that is I would use in, in the climate context is that El Nino is an, a process in the, in the East Pacific that uh, is quite heavily um, pre, a pr good predictor of temperatures over, over the US. So when you look at the lag correlation between ENSO and surface air temperatures over well all over the US, then they are significant everywhere. But if you change and uh, lag it in the other way, then you see that temperatures uh, in, in, in the land over the Americas here are correlated leading ENSO basically. And this is the issue of correlation. It doesn't tell you about causation because if you now change to a more a more causal method like bivariate Granger causality and look at the same relationships, then you see that ENSO improves the prediction of surface temperatures here over the US. But surface temperatures over the US, they don't help in predicting ENSO. So this <laughs> picture tells you very clearly that um, you shouldn't trust correlation. And it also tells you that uh, uh, America is second and ENSO first, quite. <laughs> OK. Um, moving to an example from, from space physics, where I have some collaborators. This is more to, to, to show you an example where um, there has been a lot of hypothesis on here, two variables that I'm not going into detail now regarding magnetospheric uh, storms, which are quite relevant for satellite failures and how they are related. and. If you look at mutual information between solar wind drivers, so on the left-hand side here, you find like basically the influence of the sun, the solar wind, the magnetic wind, and everything is mutually uh, sharing information, you would say, with, with everything, especially those. If you look at bivariate transfer entropy, the method that is going towards bivariate range causality, then you still see relationships between those two because these methods, they don't take into account those solar drivers. And if you explicitly remove the effect of those, then you see that there's actually no relationship between uh, substorms and storms. And this is just an example where from observational causal inference, we can now deduce that there's no physical mechanism between uh, AL and SIMH here, but it's completely explained by the solar wind. And this can give you an intuition of well, that means that we can, we shouldn't think about mechanisms here and also that um, a better predictor for either of those variables is the solar wind rather than any of those. Um, this is from physiology. Also here again, a picture of uh, heartbeats, diastolic and systolic blood pressure, and everything is mutually informed with everything here again. And if you apply this method here, PCMCI again from what I would have, showed you before, then you see that this is the mechanism that comes out. So uh, heart rate drives diastolic and that then systolic blood pressure. And this helps you to say that, okay, there's a causal chain in this direction. We shouldn't look for a mechanism here. Of course, interpreting this as a causal link means uh, we cannot, we, we assume that there's no other variable that is on the way here or that is even a common driver. We cannot deduce that from this. So. The more robust statement is that B and S are not having any physical mechanism between them. That is not due to D. Okay, mm, 
well, maybe just a mention of you can not only talk about direct links, but you can also measure, for example, how much is an intermediate variable, um, like here, number zero, mediating a causal effect. Here is an example from climate by which Enzo drives the monsoon region, which is quite relevant for rainfall there. And here we see that there's this strong in mediated effect. So Indonesian pressure here is strongly um, an intermediate node on this uh, causal um, relationship. And it's often interesting, given a lot of paths between many variables to study, which intermediate variables are relevant. So this can help to identify um, not just the direct links, but also which variables are mediating a causal effect. So that can help to distinguish maybe variables that are quite relevant um, mediators and that might be good to intervene on. I don't know if you have a system that where you can intervene on and this is the culprit for maybe adverse causal effects, then you can intervene in this node to stop those. Mm. Yeah, more of this is in a more earlier nature communications paper. Last thing is often a problem might be that you want to just predict forecast and your input variables are not five or 10 or 20 or 100 individual variables, but you have measured fields. So in climate, this is the satellite uh, data. So at every latitude and longitude location, you have those um, available. And what if you have one target variable? Then one thing you can do here is first you dimensionally reduce uh, your gridded variable data um, with respect to that target variable. And there's many ways to do that. You can study correlations and look for regions that are similarly correlated with the target variable and then lump them together as one variable, as is illustrated here. And then you can um, run causal discovery on those aggregated variables and go from everything that is correlated, sorry, to uh, just the few ones that are directly relevant as a predictor, a precursor for your target variable. And then once you know this, you can build a much more parsimonious model. So that's one use case of causal inference is to build more parsimonious uh, forecasting models. Like here, the stratospheric polar vortex, you just model it as a function of the parents rather than as a function of the whole field or of all those aggregated variables. And you can interpret those then, which is also nice in this case, and these are physically relevant and they lead to good predictions. And concluding, um, I want, I hope I, I convey to you the, the basic idea that causal inference is about answering causal questions from empirical data really. And the output of methods will, will be some graph, maybe some uncertainty quantification, but whatever causal conclusions you draw are based on assumptions that you're willing to make. And they are ideally well discussed in the method paper. So you can reason about them. And these are, as I've gone into uh, some detail, the causal Markov condition, faithful efficiency, time order, uh, stationarity, um, and maybe assumptions on the dependency types, linearity and the distributions of noise. And um, maybe something more, some other assumptions, and there's quite something in literature that, and again, enables you to learn something about causal relations. But it's of course important to, to notice that some are more assumptions that you can just state and not test, and some you can actually test like linearity. So, so it should be, well, if you, if you reason about them and pose that something causes something, then it's good to state your assumptions. Obviously, it's good to, to run different methods and test because if you want to take decisions based on the causal graph, uh, like interventional decisions, design decisions, then that um, may have strong effects. So you should discuss uh, these. Concluding, um, so I hope I convinced you that causal discovery from observational data is actually possible, even though unobserved variables are present. The challenge that's, that we have in, in the Earth system, but I guess in many other systems, are stem, stemming from this nonlinear uh, nature of the system, maybe also spatial temporal. I've shown you one method, PCMCI, that I developed that addresses some of those uh, challenges. And some application cases are testing causal hypothesis. This is quite relevant in climate, obviously, where understanding processes is important. In, in engineering problems, you might need to look at fault detection, 
trying to find the root cause of certain um, failures in the system. You might want to optimize experimental designs because I, I mentioned this briefly, all the causal links that you get from such a method based on just observational data, if you don't want to assume uh, that there's no unobserved variables, they can still be, they can still help you to trim down the possible causal links because if there's no link, then it's unlikely that there's one. So that can lead to much better optimal experimental designs. You don't need to do a B testing for a large number of variables. Um, general, it's a causal variable selection that you can use this for. And this also includes uh, forecast steeps. I didn't talk about how to evaluate climate models, which you can do, or also if you have other models with this, um, but it's in a paper. And that being said, I'm, I'm open for, for projects. If you have projects in mind and there's some overlap with, uh, between the interests that we have in the group, uh, yeah, there's some options to collaborate on this. And with this, I want to conclude. And thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from anybody? I had a question when you were um, talking about different applications. You were explaining how this can be used uh, to uh, model the heart, etc. Um, do, you, do you have like a, a, either an intuition or a studies around which system this should work for and uh, conversely, which system this would not work for. If I take the example of uh, trying to predict ep epidemics, for example, uh, this looks like a very chaotic system where um, like each uh, causal relationship will have a lot of uh, impact on the overall uh, modeling. Do you have a sense of um, if this would be somewhere we could apply this technique to or not? Yeah, I mean, you would kind of, look at this picture here and see which of those challenges uh, occur in, in your system. And then you can look for methods that uh, are able to address those. So, yeah, in epidemics, I mean, you, you first would, of course, need a lot of data on uh, your, I mean, in this case, it would be, I don't know, coronavirus uh, outbreak. And then you would have a number of variables and try to model how which variables affect each other and you would need observational data. So if you have like data from other epidemics or now from Corona or from, I don't know, well, Ebola is already in a different region where it occurred, then you already make assumptions on the outbreak and the spread and the observational data set that we have translates to the one where we want to make predictions, like do the same uh, dynamics occur? Mm. It's it's complex. Uh, Conversely, so it seems like in earth science, this is a, a, a like pretty good use case, even though there are many challenges. Are there other uh, systems that are uh, like you've seen good results using this technique? Yeah, I mean, well, there's there's not just there's there's a, there's a large bunch of methods that so so causal inference methods are frequently used in in economics. They are more and more used in, in, in medicine, um, in genetics. So in many of these fields, you can actually run also experiments, like in, in knockout experiments in, in genetics. So it's, the, it's quite spreading to, to many different fields. And each field has slightly different challenges. So I hope I kind of grasp a lot of them here, but some might be more relevant in, in some fields. And it's, it's still, there's a lot to do uh, regarding the method. So you can, you, can, you can start, I would say, but um, a lot of problems still persist so far. It all depends on, on the use. Yeah. You can find more in those, in those references here, like this perspective paper and nature communications of, of last year is basically what, what I talked about, giving you and also giving you a lot of references. And um, the software here has tutorials and so on to get you started to, to also get into these topics. Well, awesome. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Actually, we're looking at it right now. Um, cool. Well, have a great evening. Thanks for giving us this, this wonderful talk. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, just write me if you have, uh, if you have questions. And Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, some OK.